name is Jim Will, and today we want to learn how to accomplish a lot of things, work effectively with people, and still manage stress. Well, our main objective today is going to be quite simple, and it's to help you to realize that as you accomplish a lot of things, get a lot of things done, and as you work effectively with people, our stress level automatically takes care of itself usually. And isn't that true? So many times uh, we're looking for the, the solution to reduce stress. And, and what I've noticed is a lot of times within our work environment or in our home environment, uh, the stress is caused from not accomplishing things and not working well or effectively with people. So that'll be our goal and our objective today, is how we can accomplish a lot more than we even thought was possible, and then how can we develop that harmony within our organization or our family uh, to, to really work effectively with the people. How do we do that? Well, let's first start by uh, looking at just how can we accomplish more things. If you're an owner or a boss or a supervisor or manager, uh, do you know what you want to accomplish? Do your people know what is needed or what is expected of them? Uh, do we have our goals clearly and specifically written down? The daily goals, the weekly goals, the monthly goals, uh, the yearly goals, the quarterly goals, all of those things are so very, very important for us to not only know in our own mind, but to have uh, those in a, in a clear way to show and manifest those to the people in our organization. If you're working, as a support person, do you have some kind of a system that you can take notes in, that you can write down all of your priorities, your A and your B priorities, your to-do list, your things that you would like to accomplish today? I think that's so very, very important. You feel like you can keep it all up here in your head. Um, I think we're, we're, we're really not being honest and truthful with ourselves. I remember a story about Einstein once and the Somebody asked him a question and he didn't really know the answer, but he said, I know where to get the answer. And I think that that's more or less what we can do to help ourselves. We may not be able to keep everything up here in our head, but if we'll write it down, put it down in some kind of a spiral notebook, some kind of a, a day planner, an organizer, something that will help you to know what you're trying to accomplish today, this week, next week. And go ahead and like I mentioned, prioritize them into A and B priorities. If you'll do that, that's going to help us tremendously to accomplish more every day. Well, how do we get along with people? How do we uh, start to communicate better and, and more effectively with people? Well, you know, we've mentioned this before. A Mellon Foundation study came out and they said that our real success is based on, on our communication skills. Uh, they even had a statistic that said that 85% of our success is based on how well we're communicating. So in order for us to work effectively, and meaningfully with people, with, with our family members as well as with the people in our organization, our real job is to become a psychologist or to become even more so than a psychologist, become a very, very good communicator. Again, uh, if you're a supervisor or, or a manager or an owner or boss, uh, what kind of a work environment have you provided for your people? Is it uh, conducive to creative thinking? Are creative thinkers allowed within your organization, in your department, uh, in your company? Or are they put down? Are they more or less, in one way or another, told not to be creative, uh, not to solve problems? That uh, if you do that, you might be making the rest of us looking bad. So again, it's going to be very, very important for us to have the proper, the right uh, work environment. For us, if again, if you're in management, talk to your people, to ask your people their feelings, their thoughts, their concerns, they're a lot of times the ones that are out there in the trenches. They're the ones that are out there uh, either dealing with your customers, your clients, or your patients. Uh, they're dealing with the public so often that it's very, very important for you to get a, an accurate account, a, a pulse reading exactly of what is happening and what's happening in their own minds, in their heads. Do they feel comfortable? Do they feel like that they can talk to you, that they can communicate with you, that they can even tell you some problems or some things that are on their mind? Uh, or do you perhaps say, oh yes, my door is open any time, and if they come in, <laughs> it may even be slammed in their face before they even walk in, or you may give off signals or body language that may be sending out communication signals that will not allow that person to open up and to communicate and to work effectively with you and with the other people in the organization. 
And again, our job really is to communicate effectively and to bring about that communication uh, within the organization, one department communicating and respecting the other department. Uh, that is so very, very important for us to have respect for ourselves and respect for other people. Uh, I've mentioned before that people that do not have that respect for one another, unfortunately, it's uh, a, a result of a low self-image, a low self-esteem, not feeling really good about yourself. And if we go around putting other people down, not working effectively with each other, uh, sabotaging things uh, in order for them not to get accomplished or not to uh, be completed on time, if we're doing that, we're really screaming out that, you know, I've got a low self-image. I'm not a team worker. I'm not a team player. So what we want to do is to become aware uh, that, yes, we do have a good self-image, a good self-esteem, uh, that we uh, can work effectively with people, that we can work together as a team, as a whole. Well, what happens with stress? As we start to develop the harmony with the uh, people that we work with, as our families start to communicate in harmony and in peace, uh, what happens to the stress then? What happens when we start to accomplish a lot of things? Don't you feel really good and proud and, and feel uh, energetic about yourself and, and your true motivation comes when you're accomplishing things and you're feeling good about yourself? When we are accomplishing things and we, we are communicating and working effectively with people, then, uh, and this is the beautiful part about this, then the, the, the stress and the strain, the tension, the anxiety, they start to dissipate. And a lot of times we think, well, it's because of the work environment, it's because of the weather, it's because of my boss, it's because of this person, it's because of I've got too many things to do, I'm getting burned out, I'm, I'm, I'm losing control, I'm, I've got all this t tension, this anxiety, this pressure. Is that really what's causing it? Or is it really the miscooperation, uh, the lack of uh, trust, the lack of working together as a team? I think that those are the things that will not only cause and increase your stress level, but they will also keep you and your organization or your company, your department, will keep you from really accomplishing more every day. So the key is to make sure that we have a team of people that are cooperating, that are, that are problem solvers and not creating problems. Uh, they're not whiners. They're not uh, looking for reasons why things won't work. As long as we know that something won't work, then we will build a blind spot or, technically speaking, a scotoma. Well, what's a scotoma? Well, it's spelled S-C-O-T-O-M-A. A scotoma is a, a Latin word meaning a lack of perceptual vision. And any time we've got impossibility thinkers, people that are thinking, no way, it won't work. We've tried it before. It didn't work then. Uh, why rock the boat? Why try to change now? We've always done it this way. Anytime that we have attitudes and beliefs and people in our organization like that, we will build that scotoma or blind spot, that lack of perceptual vision to new, new solutions, uh, new ways of uh, providing services for our, our patients, for our customers, uh, new ways of helping other departments, new ways of communicating. And as organizations and departments and, and hospitals and companies and everywhere, as, as we start to increase our ability to communicate, watch out because your profits will start to rise as well. Now, how do we uh, accomplish all this? And, and what if I am not an owner, if I'm not a manager, if I'm, uh, say, a support person? Well, a couple of things. One is what kind of an environment, what kind of a work environment would you like to have? Well, gee, Jim, it'd be great if everybody worked in harmony. It'd be great if we accomplished everything day in and day out. But crises come in all of a sudden. And we've got our list. We've got our to-do list. We've got our A and B priorities. But all of a sudden, somebody throws us a curve. What do we do then? All right, let's just take a simple example. Let's just take a simple situation here. Maybe the way that you've responded to that in the past might be costing you valuable time. It might be causing you a lot of stress and strain. Again, if we're saying things like, well, if one more thing happens, I'm just going to explode, then guess what happens? We might be blind, again, building one of those scotomas, we might be blind to a way that we can delegate some of that. Delegate? Oh, wait a second. Delegate? Well, now don't tell me you're still trying to do all that work yourself. Well, we need to delegate, don't we? 
And the only way to delegate is to make sure that we have people that we can trust. If we have a person that we don't trust in our organization, then you are not going to delegate it. You're not going to feel proper or feel free or feel confident in giving that uh, ball or giving that assignment, asking that person for help if you don't have that trust, that support. All right, let's take another situation. Say, for instance, you are in that environment. What's going to happen to you? Well, I'll tell you what, if you really want a pleasant, harmonious working environment, one in which you feel like you accomplish a lot of things day in and day out, and if that work environment is not that way where you're presently working, I'm afraid that people like you are going to have, to, they're going to leave. They're going to find a place that appreciates them. And again, smart supervisors, smart owners, smart managers are going to be uh, trying to develop that work environment where everybody is working in harmony, everybody is cooperating, working together as a team. Because they know, the smart managers, the smart owners, they know that two or three things might take place. If they don't curb the negative whiner type of person, the person that's an impossibility thinker, then they're going to find out, they're going to know for sure that either the good people that are in that organization are going to start to, well, why try? Let's just act like that other person. Or they're going to lose that quality person, and then who do they replace them with? So it's very, very important for an owner and manager, and unfortunately, uh, or perhaps fortunately, usually there's a small, very, very small percentage of people that are negative and that are impossibility thinkers. But that owner and that manager has got to take it upon their own sense of, of accomplishment to talk to that person, to interview them, and it would be a good idea to even do this as they're being hired and, and as soon as they are hired, to let them know what is expected. Not only their job skills, not only the things that you want them to do day in and day out on a technical basis, uh, but what kind of communication skills would you like for them to have? Uh, what kind of attitudes would you like for them to have? Uh, what kind of cooperation do you expect from them? Uh, what kind of a team member do you expect them to, to perform under? And if you will seriously let the people know what their uh, expectations are of you, and if you will go ahead and make sure that you will follow through with that and say, wait a second, you're doing very well in these areas, but these areas over here, you need to change. I expect you to change. I expect more out of you. I know you can do that then all of a sudden we will start to improve and increase our productivity. We'll start to uh, increase the amount of things that we thought were possible to accomplish in, in a certain amount of time, in a day or an hour. Uh, we will start to be able to handle crisis in a lot more professional and classy manner. And then as we again start to work effectively with people, respect them and feel good about uh, ourselves and other people, then all of a sudden, like I mentioned, that stress is going to dissipate. Well, in summary, let's just consider a couple of quick things. One, in order to accomplish things, we've got to work effectively with people. Now, very seldom can we do it all ourselves. And in order to work effectively with people, yes, we've got to realize that our real job is communicating. It's communicating with our children, with our spouses. It's communicating with our bosses, with our subordinates, with our fellow employees, with other departments. As we start to work effectively with people, communicating effect effectively with them, and as we start to do that, we will accomplish more things, and I guarantee the stress will start to dissipate. Thank you very much. Until our next visit, this is Jim Will. Jim Will, and today we're going to try to figure out how we can really create more time by taking control of our priorities. I wish I had a magic wand, believe me. I wish I could stop that clock and wave that magic wand over to where we would have more time each and every day. But unfortunately, that clock doesn't have a tendency to stop for anyone. So what we want to do is to really start to understand how we can start to create more time and feel like we've got more time and accomplish a lot of things. Now what we want to do probably at the very beginning is to uh, do a little self-audit, a time audit, and ask ourselves, how organized are we? 
How mentally organized are we? Uh, do we sometimes add to our own confusion? Uh, are there times in which we may be sabotaging our day without even knowing it? Do you feel like a pack rat sometimes, looking at your desk, holding on to files and information that may not really be of value to you, and, and, but you're going to hold on to it because someday you may need it? Does any of your desk ever look like one of those uh, little patches of yellow paper everywhere stuck on, on your walls and on the, on the desk? Do you ever feel like you're just spinning your wheels? Well, I'm afraid that we're probably all guilty of this from time to time. And what we want to do is to really start to think about some of the things that have caused us uh, the wasted time. And I put together a list of those, and one of the first ones is, is really not planning or organizing or getting uh, everything lined up before we start a project. Have we set down our priorities in that organization? Have we planned? Have we done those things? And that's what's going to be very, very important. Another thing that's going to be very important for us to realize, especially if we're in management, have we been ineffectively delegating things to people? Perhaps not uh, making sure that they either understood what we wanted them to do, or perhaps we weren't following up on a certain timetable, making sure that they knew how important this project was realizing how urgent the project is and asking them to make sure that they are giving you reports or status of the project on a periodic basis. Something else that is so important is we may be personally disorganized. And you know, that's kind of a scary feeling. If you walk into a person's office or you ask them a question and you say, well, do you have that answer? And they start to scramble around everywhere on their desk trying to find uh, that particular bit of information that will help you. It uh, doesn't really give you the security that you would have as opposed to somebody who is organized, they have a neat desk, they're personally organized to where they can give you the information that you're requesting without any trouble at all. How about this one? Uh, failing to anticipate crises. If you will really consider that one and think about how we can make some backup systems, how we can start to organize our thoughts and organize the people that we're working with so that if there is a crisis, it doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect us near as bad as if we weren't prepared for that crisis. Just a couple more that I think are very, very important. One is perhaps trying to attempt to do too much. Um, it's going to be so important for you to learn how to just say no and to say no politely and with class and with dignity. But a lot of people and a lot of high performance people say, sure, give it to me, I'll do it, no problem, uh, which is a great attitude to have. But are you burdening yourself with a lot of undue stress and strain? Do you have the trust and the confidence in people, your coworkers or your employees, to where you can delegate that out effectively, to where you can give some of that uh, the, the things that are being laid upon you. You can delegate it, you can give it to people, you can start to still perhaps uh, accept the responsibilities of a lot of projects, but you're able to, to orchestrate it in a very smooth, very easy manner. Another one of the concepts that I think is so very, very important in, in trying to help us to be aware of maybe some areas that we're wasting time, do you plan with your boss or your supervisor on a regular basis? Are you setting a time uh, each day, each week, uh, quarterly, whatever the case might be, to where you can sit down and find out specifically, clearly and specifically, what your boss or your supervisor is wanting, what their goals, what their objectives, what their priorities are. How urgent is it? What do they see the urgency as being? Now, if you'll keep those things in mind and start to realize that, yes, we might all waste time from time to time, However, if we start to think about those, and of course there's a lot of others that we can consider, but if you'll start to really be honest with yourself and give yourself that, uh, that time audit and see which of these areas that you might be wasting some of your precious time, fine, all right. What about when we want to try to get other people organized? Boy, wouldn't that be nice if we had that magic wand? If all of a sudden we could just go over there to Mary or Bill or Carol or anybody and we start to just wave that little magic wand over them and they would be instantly organized. Well, that would be really nice, but I don't think that that's really going to take place. But what we can do, and especially if you're in management, is to make sure that your goals and your aspirations are clearly defined 
for your employees? Do they understand what you're wanting? And are they held responsible? And are they held accountable? I remember in a meeting, uh, one of my clients, we would be sitting there week in and week out having a staff meeting, talking about all the goals and aspirations of the owner, of the management, and yet the following week would come by and it was the same old situation. Uh, nothing had really been accomplished. Nothing had really taken place. Oh yes, one person would say, I meant to do that, but I forgot. <laughs> well, that is costing you not only money and productivity, but it's also costing you a lot of of um, stress and strain and tension and anxiety, which you really don't want. So one way to make sure that your people are accountable for their actions is to write it down and let them see you writing it down. Go ahead and make a note that Bill said that he would have this accomplished or the, he would have that report or this segment of the project to me by next Tuesday and have it written down. Go ahead and write that down and make sure that he gets it written down as well. And if you will hold people accountable, and hold them responsible for wanting to make sure that they're effective time managers and that they are controlling their time and also making sure that they know their priorities and which ones are priorities. You know, another situation, this may sound great and it sounds really good to an to a owner or a manager or a boss, but what happens when you try to get somebody, uh, an employee or a co-worker, to buy into some of these things? And I know what happens a lot of times, they may look at you and go, but you don't know the situation. But all of a sudden I try to get organized and I try to set up my priorities and all of a sudden the phone rings or all of a sudden we have a, an extra patient that we weren't aware of or all of a sudden uh, this particular project is due. And, and a lot of times people will feel like, oh my gosh, everything's going to be done or needs to be done all at once. Uh, this is going to be extremely important for you to realize that you can juggle more than just one priority at a time. You don't have to complete that priority before you go on to another one. But to really be mentally prepared to handle the crises, to handle those situations, to handle uh, the different priorities that may be coming up before your very eyes just like that. Do you have backup systems? What happens if all of a sudden uh, you come to work and and you've got things organized, you're organized, you've got things prioritized, uh, you're controlling your time, but all of a sudden the phone does ring, and all of a sudden another crisis comes in, and all of a sudden your assistant calls in and they're sick. Well, what do we do and how can we develop that backup system? And I think that's going to be very, very important. People that have a good self-image, that feel good about themselves, are going to accept and to share their knowledge and their information with other people. They're not going to hoard it. They're not going to hold on to it and, and make themselves extremely valuable because they're the only ones that can find that particular bit of information. But they're going to be the ones that will really help develop that backup system for you in case they are sick or in case they do uh, take a vacation or if something does happen. So a backup system in alleviating a lot of those crises will really help you a, a tremendous amount. Well, this sounds good. What do we do? How do we start to implement it? Uh, it's going to be a mental process, isn't it? Uh, just about all of life is a mental process. And what do I mean by that? Attitudes, your attitudes, your beliefs, your opinions, uh, the beliefs and the attitudes that you have and that you picked up, some of which might be myths, some of which might not really be valid in today's uh, environment, but the beliefs and the attitudes that you have been reinforcing with your own thinking, with your own mind chatter, that self-talk, yes, you have been developing attitudes about setting priorities and how much time you have in a day. You can hear what your attitude is, what your belief, system, your belief systems are uh, by just listening to yourself talk. What are you saying to yourself? I've got so much to do, I just don't think I'm going to get anything done today. And then what happens? We might go down the hall and visit with somebody, or if somebody calls us up, we start to say something like, well, oh, I'm so glad you called. You wouldn't believe all the things I've got going today, and I just can't seem to get everything done. They're expecting so much of me. So what we want to do and this is going to help relieve and alleviate a lot of the tension, anxiety, and the pressure and, and the stress, is if you will ask yourself honestly, you know, what are your beliefs and your attitudes about setting priorities and about the amount of time that you have? 
What we really want to do is to help you to start to feel like there is more time. We can't expand the clock. We can't stop it. We don't have that magic wand. But what's important is for us to start to feel like that we've got more time on our hands. And to have your attitudes checked as well as your co-workers, as well as your fellow employees and, and the people that you might be managing and supervising. What we'd like to do also is to look at a few tips. And I went through my files and, and started to research some of the things that I think are going to really help you to expand and to perhaps have extra time on your hands. Some of the tips that we can um, utilize in helping us to expand the amount of time that we might have would be to keep meetings short and to the point. Make sure that you've got a goal and objective and you've got an end result that you want from that meeting. Go ahead and give an agenda out. Let the people know what is going to be on that meeting, the starting time as well as the ending time. Another aspect is to be able to control telephone calls and unexpected visitors. Make sure that you, again, can keep some kind of control to where maybe a secretary, somebody else that can help you to screen out those unnecessary phone calls, or, or maybe they're very, very important, but they're not going to really be helpful to you right now. Have that person be able to help you to screen out some of those phone calls and make them at a later point. Go ahead and while you're working on a particular project, make sure that you are focused and centered on those things. Look at some of the reports that come across our desk. How many of them are unnecessary? Are you a speed reader? Have you learned how to, to read fast, uh, to really go quickly and, and glaze over a, a, a periodical or a magazine or an article, something that can help you in your profession? Now, these are just a few of the things that can help us to, to create more time and at the same time stay focused on our priorities, realizing that we may have one priority for the day, we may have a dozen priorities. But if you will stop and, and start to listen to your self-talk, those beliefs and those attitudes are going to be very, very important for you to check within yourself and other people. Hold yourself and other people accountable. Make sure that we are responsible, that we're not blaming other people, we're not blaming other departments, we're not blaming other situations for the reasons as why we're not really prioritizing and utilizing our time effectively. If you will try these things, Really, start to control your, your self-talk. Start to manage it. Make sure that it's centered and focused. Start to ask yourself some of the things that you may be wasting time on. Start to be honest with yourself there as well, and also make sure that the people that are working with you are auditing their time. And then go around and start to cherry pick. Start to ask and see other people that are really good time managers, that are in control of their time and are really in control of their priorities. If you will do that, and then again, through a process called visualization, practicing it over and over and again in your mind to perfection, perfect practice makes perfect. Not necessarily practice, 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 but perfect practice is what really makes perfection. If you will try these, I know it will help you to maintain control of your time and also to make sure that you are in control of those priorities each and every day. Try these and I know it will work for you. Thank you very much. This is Jim Will. Hi, my name is Jim Will. And today we want to talk on uh, certainly one of my favorite subjects, and I think it's probably one of yours too, especially when we are the customer, and that is how to give exceptional customer service. And I say that because how many times have we been in a situation in which we did not receive very good customer service? Well, today our main objective is going to help you to really start to understand a concept that was told to me many years ago. And at first, I don't know that I really understood it, but it sure does make a lot of sense. And that is, nobody really cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And isn't that the truth? We really don't care that uh, perhaps that hospital is the finest in the world, or that restaurant is the greatest in town, or that department store is the best of all the department stores there are, until we know that the people in the organization really do care. Well, what are some of the examples of uh, poor customer service? 
Uh, I'm afraid that we could spend a lot of time and, and perhaps uh, humor ourselves, and it perhaps wasn't very humorous at the time that it was occurring, but I recall one situation in which I was speaking to a group of doctors and nurses, and it happened to be at a hotel, and all of a sudden uh, we needed a few extra people. Actually, a few extra people came, and we needed a few extra chairs. And I asked one of the bellmen if he could mind bringing a few extra chairs and some pencils and paper, uh, that we needed those as well. And he looked at me and he said, I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. And I was shocked. I said, well, please, can you uh, go and try to find the chairs and, and perhaps find the extra pens and paper? And he said, catering never has anything. <laughs> catering never has anything. So very important point here. Who are our customers? Well, not only the people that we think of as customers, but the different departments. And in that particular situation, catering. Or in another particular situation, the other department might be a customer. What about some other situations in which perhaps poor customer service? I know uh, I was working with a company several years ago in which they brought me in to try to help them increase their sales and their productivity. And we had a meeting one morning at 7 a.m. and the phone started to ring somewhere around 7.15, 7.30. And I remember one of the people looked at uh, somebody that was about to pick up the phone and answer the telephone and they said, no, don't do that until 8 o'clock. We don't open up until 8 o'clock. Well, how many times do we have customers that are asking for us to please service them and yet, no, the rules are, we're going to stand by it, we've always done it this way. My gosh, a uh, story was related to me uh, by a young man in which he had gone into a department store and the person that was waiting on him had a little button that said, you want a quarter? Call somebody that cares. Now, wouldn't that really make you feel comfortable shopping in that particular department store? Uh, those are situations, and like I say, we could go on and on and on uh, in situations in where we have received and, and saw other people perhaps receive poor customer service. So what we want to do is to really think about what is going to allow us to give uh, excellent, exceptional, fanatical customer service. We've all heard before that the customer is always right, and I totally agree. I truly do feel like the customer is always right. Now, there may be times in which the customer is asking or demanding in an unreasonable or even a very demeaning manner, but still what we need to do is to help our people, if they're on a counter, if they're in front of the public, if they are having to deal with problem situations, make sure that we have empowered them to take care of that situation and also to make sure that they own the problem. Make sure that if they mess up, that they go ahead and take the responsibility, the accountability, and go ahead and solve that situation. Make sure that they're empowered to solve the problems that perhaps either the organization or the company or that they may have caused and created. What do we do if there is a situation in which a customer is unhappy? Well, first of all, make sure that you act quickly. Go up to them very quickly and acknowledge them and let them know that you really do care Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So we can go up and say, oh yes, we really do care. What's wrong? What can we do to help you? But if our tone of voice and our body language and the way we're coming across is not sincere and if it is not really coming across in a caring manner, then that's going to hurt us. So we want to make sure that our attitude is in line, that we are really genuinely caring, that we are empathetic, that we're not as sympathetic as we are empathetic, that we can understand uh, from that person's view why they may be feeling that way. A lot of times people who are really who are complaining about poor customer service, they're really just crying out for help. They're really just saying, will somebody please help me? Will somebody please listen to what my, my problem is? And will somebody please come up with a solution? And that's what will help your organization, your department, your team, your company to start to develop that exceptional service is when people come to the rescue. One of my clients from years back owned a restaurant in which he said any time that he had an upset or an irate customer, he considered it a golden opportunity. And I remember kind of doing a double take and saying, well, Billy, what do you mean by that? And he said, any time that a customer is unhappy, they feel like it's a golden opportunity for them to go and rescue them, take care of their problems, find out how to make amends, uh, reduce or, or uh, waive the, the cost of whatever it is that the problem is, and for them to go ahead and 
turn that into a golden opportunity to where the customer is not only happy and satisfied, but they become loyal. They become loyal. And that, I think, is a very, very important point to remember the difference between happy and satisfied customers and loyal customers. The difference is that loyal customers will go out and give you free advertising. Uh, they'll promote it. They'll be an outside, outside salesperson for you without expecting or, or uh, wanting any kind of commission. So go ahead and, and make sure that if there are situations that your people are ready, they're poised, they do not take it personally when somebody's jumping down on them. Make sure that they are empowered and that they can go ahead and solve that problem for you. Give them that, that sense of being able to solve any kind of a problem that may come up. Well, how important is advertising and marketing? Very important, I'll grant you that, but at the same time, how many times have organizations, companies, uh, hospitals, restaurants, hotels, airlines, all kinds of organizations have spent millions, probably in the billions, trying to promote their company, their image, their corporate image. How important is that? Well, that's very important because it gets the word out, lets people know that that organization exists. But what happens is as soon as uh, the advertising brings in that person or that customer into your organization, then it's your people, isn't it? It's your people that are being tossed the ball, and it may be the receptionist, it may be the doorman, it may be uh, a nurse, it may be a doctor, it may be um, a number of different, everybody, in my opinion, and you've heard this before, I believe that everybody is in sales. Everybody is, and not just those people that are out there uh, as known as salesmen, but everybody is in sales. And if you will start to think about that concept of you being in sales, and who are your customers? Perhaps the physician is a customer of yours, or perhaps the nurse is a customer of yours. Perhaps the patient is our, pa is our customer. Perhaps the, the person that's coming to your restaurant or to your hotel. Whatever the case is, You've got those as customers, but you've also got the people within your organization, the different departments. We need to have love and respect for ourselves and others. And if you will truly do that, and, and this is very important, if we don't truly respect and love ourselves, if we don't have a very good feeling about ourselves, a very good self esteem, self image, then we will automatically put people down without knowing it. We may be putting ourselves down and other people down. So what we want to do is to make sure that we do have a good, strong self-image. We feel good about ourselves. We feel good about other people. And then we will be more than happy to go and come to the rescue of a customer, whether they be down the hall and a coworker or the person that's actually helping us to, to make a salary, to make money for our organization. Your people. How important are they? Well, it's obvious. You've got to take care of them. You've got to see them as your customer. If you are a, an owner or a manager, do you hear them? Do you listen to them? Do you allow them to come into your office and to uh, let things off their chest? Uh, are you really empathetic to the people in your organization? Your people will mimic and act just like you are as a manager or as an owner. So. If you're not very happy with the people in your organization, we've got to come back and look at ourselves and ask, am I treating customers and people the right way? Do I expect our people in our organization to really do those little extras, the little things that will create that customer service, that customer loyalty? One thing that I think is so important is in addition to what we've previously mentioned is how can we get our people within the organization to buy into these concepts. How can we get the people in our department or in your company, how can we get them to really buy into customer service, cu exceptional customer service? On a ship once, there was a maitre d', and uh, he was very, very proud of the fact that he had eyes everywhere. He had eyes in the back of his head, he had eyes everywhere. And the key is he sensed, he felt, he loved his job. He really enjoyed it so much. He would stand there waiting on his tables, and he would maybe have three or four different tables, but he would be standing there just like this, thinking, how can I be a better service? How can I help this person? What would they like? What would, what would make their evening better? Now please, if you'll take the pride and the dignity that you deserve and that you do have, and go ahead and make sure that you are where you want to be, that you are happy, you're very pleased at the job, the profession that you have chosen. 
If you will make sure that you are happy and you want to be at your job, then customer service, exceptional customer service, is going to become very easy, very enjoyable for you. The challenge is, if not everybody in the entire organization sees things or believes in it or buys into it the way that you do. And that becomes very frustrating. And the sad part about that is they may lose you. They may lose somebody that really does care about the customers if they don't take care of that person in terms of expecting those kinds of qualities and characteristics to be manifested throughout the whole organization. Why don't you go ahead and ask yourself this simple question. What is a customer worth to you in a lifetime, their lifetime? If a person may be shopping with you for maybe 10, 15, 20 years, how much is that going to be of, of, of real monetary value to you or your company? I know one of my clients uh, is a dry cleaning organization in which they figured out that for every person that brings in their shirts or their suits, that over a lifetime, the average person will spend somewhere around twenty to $25,000 in dry cleaning, in laundry. Now, boy, that is a, a, an enormous amount of money, and we may not even think uh, that we would be spending that much. But they took the time, the effort, and the energy to find out exactly what is a customer worth to them. And all of a sudden, they start to say to their people, they empower their people, that you do have the freedom, the responsibility to act just like the owner. If this shirt is not done right, if that suit is not up to their expectations, why argue? Why not just, again, realize that the customer is always right and come to their rescue and solve their problem? It can really be a fun and exciting experience for all people involved. In summary, let's think about this very closely, very, very specifically as to the difference between happy and satisfied customers and loyal customers. And Loyal customers are only going to come about, in my opinion, by giving them fanatical, exceptional uh, customer service to where you really do love what you're doing. It's not a burden. They're not a burden. You really enjoy what you're doing, and you help them to feel comfortable and want to come back. And they're again going to come back and tell other people uh, they're going to either share good or bad news and it's up to you and your organization, your goals, your priorities, uh, your main objectives uh, that hopefully are clearly and specifically spelt out to every person in your organization. So we can have the best ad agencies, the best marketing companies, but if it, we don't have the right people, if our people don't care, if they don't have the empathy, then there we're going to have a real challenge. Make sure that your people have the empathy, that they do care, that they have a respect for their, themselves as well as for other people, and to realize that we've got customers everywhere. Not only the people that are paying our salaries, but also the customers within our whole company, our whole organization. Thank you very much for listening. Until our next time, this is Jim Will. The following program was originally aired on the PBS television show Dollars and Cents, featuring guest business consultant Dr. Jim Will, speaking on the psychology of finance. Financial independence is one of the goals most of us strive for. In this tape, Dr. Will will address this and many other aspects of your financial success. And now, let's join the program Dollars and Cents. and Cents, the program with answers to your financial questions. Featuring business and financial reporter Bill Watts and Houston-based investment advisor Jack Sorsic. Welcome to Dollars and Cents. How many times have you heard someone say, it's all in your mind? Or maybe your mother used to tell you, you can be anything you really want to be. What that suggests is that what we are, how well we do, our happiness even, are products of our attitudes. And in fact, that does largely seem to be the case. Tonight, we're going to talk about how attitude can affect financial success. With me is a man whose mother always told him he could be anything he wanted to be, as long as he cleaned up his room first. My partner, investment advisor, Jack Sorcy. 
Jack, what about attitudes affecting financial success? Well, Bill, we spend about 80% of our time on financial matters, on, on spending money, making money, uh, investing money, on, on budgeting it. And um, the results of these personal portfolios uh, are really affected by how we manage our inner business, and that's our beliefs and attitudes that we live by each day. What do you mean uh, about our attitudes affecting our personal portfolios? Well, uh, I like to say the definition of attitude is which way we're leaning towards some issue. You know, it could be a positive or a negative leaning. But we need to understand where do we um, acquire these particular attitudes. And if we can understand that, then we'll understand more on why we make decisions uh, that we make as far as uh, the investing uh, that we do. Okay, well, so uh, where do we get these attitudes? Well, really, most people don't really, I think, uh, you know, understand where they get them. But let me give you an, an example. Uh, for example, for their parents, maybe one place. Maybe their parents managed money in a certain manner. Uh, and over their, uh, when they were young, they picked up this uh, management style. Uh, and so, therefore, that is going to affect, again, their jobs. It's going to affect uh, their entire financial future. Okay. Do you, do you see other examples of this in, in your work with, with your clients? Yeah, let me give you a couple examples. One would be um, the older client who went through the Depression. Uh, they're going to be very conservative. Uh, this was a, was a horrible situation uh, where the banks were going under and a lot of problems. They look around today and they say to themselves, well, they just can't uh, take risk of any kind. And so they have very, very conservative kinds of investments. It also may affect the risks they take in their jobs or the risks they take in their business. And so this, whether it's good or bad, will uh, impact the ultimate result of how much money they make. Uh, another, a little bit different approach would be uh, the individual who says, um, call me after the first of the year. I'm just trying to get through the holidays. They have holiday depression. Uh, they've had some bad experiences over the years. And they just can't focus on anything financial, even though it's in their best interest to do some planning before the end of the year. And I guess uh, you mentioned people who grew up uh, or perhaps uh, lived through the depression. I suppose that baby boomers who've lived through what has been perhaps the most prosperous time in the history of this country and with fairly uninterrupted prosperity uh, probably have just the opposite attitude. That's right, probably until at least October the 19th of last year. I mean, there were a <laughs> yeah. lot of people, for example, in the stock market that thought it was going to go up 20, 25 percent a year uh, indefinitely. And so uh, some of those people were shocked and, and have pulled back. And others um, say it's just a temporary setback and uh, the market's uh, you know, moving to 5,500. All right. Well, our guest this evening is a fellow who knows a lot about attitudes. And uh, we're going to talk to him in just a moment. We'll be back in just a moment. Okay, we're back, and our special guest this evening is Jim Will, a business consultant who specializes in working with corporations to help their employees improve their attitudes and their productivity. We've talked to Jim about uh, working with us here at Dollars and Cents, but of course, uh, I, we really don't feel that's necessary since our productivity is just about maxed out now anyway. That's <laughs> <laughs> a good attitude, right? <laughs> Good attitude, that's right. Jim, welcome to the program, and, and let me begin by asking you a question that really relates to uh, a time when you were here with us before. You, you spoke to us about something you called self-talk, uh, sort of inner voices. Uh, what is it about self-talk? that is important to our financial success? Well, Bill, uh, in my research, I have been studying this self-talk for about 10, 11, 12 years now. And um, all through my graduate work, I really never was exposed to this concept. As a matter of fact, I was working at a state hospital at, at the time of my graduate work, and we even kidded each other about if you talk to yourself, it might be time to cash in your, your keys and <coughs> put on a white robe and uh, uh, go answer yourself some more. <laughs> but what I found is that uh, it's a common denominator with all high performance and successful people. They are managing and co uh, controlling and focusing their self-talk, which is 
in my opinion, it's a lot more than just wishful thinking or rah rah or uh, people will say, well, have a positive mental attitude. They get that confused with saying positive words. But what we're really talking about is that internal thinking or that daydreaming, which is going on at an incredible rate of speed. It's going on, say, two or three thousand words a minute as opposed to our verbalization. The talking out loud is about 150 to 200 words a minute, maybe 300 words a minute. But it's estimated that the average person's self-talk is 87% negative. And if we're thinking, we're talking to ourselves thousands of words a minute with a negative pattern, 87% of the average person's thoughts are in the negative realm, then all of a sudden what's happening is that we are sabotaging ourselves without really realizing it, without knowing it. Have you ever known anyone that has 100% negative self-talk? I mean, I know someone, I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there are folks, and as a matter of fact, before I started to understand and develop an awareness of this self-talk, I would have considered myself a very positive person. However, my self-talk was very negative. It was putting myself down. It was putting other people down, sarcastic, uh, ridiculing. Um, it was, it probably won't work type of attitude. And yet I thought, hey, I'm realistic. I know the way the world is. I know what's going to happen out there. And sure enough, it did pretty much take place that, that <laughs> negative realm, which reinforced my self-talk. I so, guess this is kind of a blind spot. Mm -hmm. Those blind spots we had mentioned the, the last program, scotomas. Now, this is an interesting concept, an interesting term. It's spelled S-C-O-T-O-M-A-S. It's a Latin word meaning a perceptual blind spot. Uh, you've heard, I'm sure, several times, the clients may come in and say, Jack, gosh, I wish you had mentioned that to me, or else I would have maybe invested. And you go, you go, my gosh, yes, I, I had mentioned that to you 10 or 11 times. <laughs> and yet the person says, well, I was there, but I didn't hear that. I didn't see that. Uh, My wife says that to me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> She'll learn that term scotoma and yeah. I'll use it on you now. Yeah. But the scotomas, the blind spots, are with all of us, but successful high-performance people have fewer of those blind spots. Uh, but we, one of the major scotomas that, that individuals and companies will have is thinking that they don't have any blind spots at all that, oh, I've got it down, I know it all, I'm, I'm aware of uh, the investment opportunities, I know all about this attitude stuff. But as soon as we do that, we definitely start to build blinders or, or scotomas to new answers and new possibilities, to opportunity knocking on our door. Well, if these little voices, uh by the way, is it always our own voice? I, I've got to ask you that. We're, 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 we're after here. your wives. <laughs> after my wife. uh, these little voices, if they're so important, uh, and if they can have such a large influence on, on our attitudes and, and our eventual success, what can we do about them? Well, and we can take it beyond just our attitudes and our success, but also into uh, our health and stress and strain. And as you had mentioned uh, prior to holidays, uh, depression, uh, anxiety. What can we do about them? Uh, the beautiful part about it is that there is a way of managing and controlling it. First, we've got to become aware of it and say, aha, yes, I do talk to myself. As a matter of fact, if there's folks out there in the audience that are thinking, what is this guy talking about, <laughs> self-talk? I don't talk to myself. I never have talked to myself. Who's talking to me? Well, that's the little voice that we're really talking about. Uh, again, it's not the words that we're saying out here because we can say, oh, yes, I'm going to make a million dollars. But if my little voice back up here says, oh, come on, Jim, who are you kidding? You know you. Every time you've ever come close to, to being successful in life, you've always messed up. You've always gotten that close, but every time you sabotage yourself. Even there was, a, a, I believe, a commercial on not long ago in which they said, honey, you know, you're really good at whatever your profession is, but when it comes to financial planning, finances, financial decision making, well, you know how you are. And what happens? The spouse's self-talk starts to go, well, yeah, I do remember how I am. I messed up on this. I messed up on that. So what we need to do is first become aware of that internal thinking, that self-talk, that daydreaming, and then start to manage it and focus it on what it is that we want. A very simple analogy that we can use in our finances or in our relationships or in our health, in any area that we'd like to apply this in, is to quit thinking about what we don't want. I don't want to lose a lot of money, okay? I know what I don't want. Go back and start to 
go to the grocery store, or the financial grocery store, with a list of things that you want. Now, it sounds simple, and it is, but it's the key to managing and controlling our self-talk. Most of us are thinking and knowing what we don't want in life or in our finances. So if we can stop that and say, okay, wait, I know what I don't want. Now, I'm not going to be pie in the sky. I'm not going to be naive and say, okay, I'm just going to say, well, I want this, I want that. What is it that I want? And do I have a plan? Do I have a stair-step, incremental way of getting to those goals? So that's what's so very, very important. This is what the high-performance person is doing. And these goals could be, uh, when you say what we want, these goals, uh, are, we, are we talking about you know, financial success? Are we talking about a savings account? Are we talking about a yacht? Uh, I mean, it, we have to think, gee, I want a yacht. Uh, so I, I go out and I work to get a yacht. Is, is that what we're talking about? You know what I would bet, and Jack, you been with so many people, I think that for the first time when you come in and you start to develop some financial plans, some financial goals, it causes people to prioritize things for the first time in their life. Yeah, I was going to say realistic, you know, realistic goals, goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. And it's something that evolves too, Jim, uh, you know, with, with any kind of objective. You know, you, you look at it at one time, but then the next year you want to see, you know, have you met that objective and you know, how are you doing, what adjustments do you need to make? But what I wanted to ask you is, that are you saying that a change in the attitudes or this uh, a change in financial personalities, maybe a way of putting it, is going to increase their portfolios? Well, not overnight. And it's not any kind of, uh, you know, a wave the magic wand and I'm going to say all these things and then my attitude's going to change. Again, we, we're not looking for a superficial change in the attitude, something that's saying, oh yes, isn't it a great day? But we're really getting into, what am I thinking? What's going on up here between our ears? And then by using that method of controlling our self-talk, we trigger a mechanism located down in the central cortex of our brain called the reticular activating system. And it's a fancy word meaning a radar system. And this is where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Because the people that are saying, I don't know where my next uh, success is going to be, but I know I'm going to accomplish so much this year. I know what it is that I want. As soon as we know what it is that we want, then the radar will help us with the five senses that we have, the eyesight, the, the hearing, the, the, the spoken word, all those things, to be at the right place at the right time. I, I don't know what I, I know what I want, but I don't know how to spell reticular. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't don't abbreviate it. R-A-S, Bill. R-A-S, <laughs> okay. RAS. <laughs> the RAS. So, you know, if, you, if you've turned on your RAS, your, your radar, this is, in fact, uh, going to make that much of a difference? You'd be surprised and amazed, and we can use a couple of simple analogies. The last time that you bought a new car, what did you start to notice out there on the highway? Uh, well, I was blind to those kinds of cars until I bought that kind, and as soon as I bought it, more than likely, I start to see uh, that kind or that make a car. And the same thing, if all of a sudden a certain company becomes your client and they happen to have logos on their cars or signs up in, in uh, properties, then all of a sudden you start to say, aha. And it's when you're going up and down Westheimer, why is it that you're a million miles away with your self-talk, but you think you saw your spouse's car? or a friend's car in all that traffic. That's your radar system. Now why do certain things get through and other things not get through? It's the filtering system that, that goes on to our brain. If we didn't have this filtering system, we would be bombarded with tons and tons of information. But what the filtering system does is it filters out things and it only lets things through that are valuable to us. Now, here's where that self-talk comes in in our attitudes. If I've got negative attitudes, negative self-talk, then guess what my radar system's going to spot? And guess what my filter system is going to screen out? Can't these, this negative self-talk and negative attitude really uh, affects, I guess, personal relationships too? Because if, if, I guess if everyone thought about it, um, you really don't like hearing uh, about someone's uh, you know, problems, you know, that people that are constantly you know, have their head hung and, and they're always in a bad mood and they, you know, they carry those problems with them all the time and they just keep compounding them. And I guess that uh, if you could, uh, you know, think about that and, and, and reduce that, um, then it would uh, obviously improve interpersonal relationships. And I think this can help you get ahead of whether it's in your job or your business. Well, you're right, Jack. Uh, I work with a lot of singles groups, and invariably it seems like a lot of singles ask the question, why is it that I always draw too many jerks? 
turkeys. <laughs> All right. What happens is that, unfortunately, as long as we know a situation that's occurring to us and it isn't what we really want, there goes our radar system, the self-talk reinforces it, and I see jerks and turkeys everywhere. The same thing happens. If I start to, and here's where our attitudes come in, if I've got an attitude that, hey, there are quality people out there, there are quality employees, there are good investments right now, then all of a sudden I'm going to spot those, whereas the opposite of it is going to keep me from seeing them. Is this, talk, go ahead. Was this what uh, you mean by talking about how a high-performance person uh, uh, seems to you know get those kinds of attitudes and, and achieve success? You betcha. A high performance, you can watch them. Uh, high performance people are managing and focusing and controlling their self-talk. They're already doing it and it's creating the end result through visualization for them. All right? Uh, the great golfers, the great athletes, they've already been there a million times and it makes the putt that much easier. It makes the field go that much easier. But the amateur gets out there and all of a sudden what their self-talk is, oh no, I'm going to probably choke it and guess what happens? They're not utilizing their true potential. And something to humble us all, good old Einstein admitted once that he said he felt like he was only using less than 10% of his potential. Let's talk about these scotomas, uh -huh. uh, blind spots. Uh, do the successful people have fewer? Or are they able to, maybe they start out with as many and were able to reduce these uh, blind bet. spots? You bet. Exactly. Uh, sc uh, successful people have got scotomas. Maybe they're not as frequent. And you know, this is what I think is maybe frustrating. Uh, you know, our audience tonight ranges from a, a novice getting into the market or getting into the finances all the way up to people that are very, very successful. Very successful people are frustrated a lot of times because they're already doing these things we're talking about tonight, and they're going, why can't everybody see it the way I see it? And that's one of our goals is to help individuals to see things the way that the boss or the manager sees them. And unfortunately, a lot of attitudes within corporations are costing the management tons and tons of money through lack of productivity. And you mentioned earlier, 80% of our time is spent on making, earning, saving, budgeting. And eight hours of most people's day is spent on, on earning that money. And if you've got people, if it's your own company, if you've got fellow workers with negative attitudes, it's costing everyone. But back to your own personal financial situation, I, I, I guess if you have these negative thoughts, uh, you basically can't make a decision. It's right. sort of a paralysis. Very good point. It will cause a type of financial paralysis. It will develop a, um, a, a stagnation mm -hmm. so that we can't make a, a decision. We may be frozen like you mentioned earlier. I'm depressed. It's before Christmas. Don't contact me now. Call me after the first of the year. Well, perhaps if they had a clear mind, they could have maybe made some decisions that would have saved them money, made them money, invested in the right area. Hey, but uh, Jim, uh, you know, at least in my contact with people, and I'm sure yours too, that people really resist, you know, any kind of change. And in realistically, you know, what what advice can you give people to help them, um, you know, change their attitude and, and become more successful? Well, uh, beautiful point, Jack, because change is around us all the time. It's getting more prevalent every day. Uh, the competition is greater and if we don't know how to change and if our people and our organizations don't know how to change or if they resist the change you can just tally it up in dollars and cents <laughs> literally and the key in change is first realizing and knowing uh, that change is possible that wait a second I no longer can afford the attitude of saying well Bill that's the way I am uh, Jack, that's the way he is. You know, that's the way they are. They've been that way forever. That's fine if it's helping us in our in our lives and our productivity. But if it's costing us, or if employees have got that kind of an attitude, they've got to realize that change is possible. The change, and this is why most change doesn't take place. The average diet lasts less than 72 hours. And what happens? And here it is about New Year's time. People will try to change, and they try to change outside without changing the self-talk right up here. And the self-talk again is, okay, I'm wanting this change, that's fine, Jim, but what is my, what's my little voice back there saying about the whole situation? One thing that you, uh, you told me here a while back is that when you walk into a business, just walking into it, 
uh, and you meet some of the people right away, you can kind of get a feel for what that the, the, the business is. The, when you ask them, you know, gee, how are things going today? And they say things are lousy. Mm -hmm. You know, right away, you know that you have some problems. Well, it's amazing how uh, you talk to a manager or an owner and you say, how are things going? They say, well, business is coming back. And you might talk to a receptionist or somebody that's doing some work uh, and you say, well, how's business here in the same company? And they say, it's terrible. And you go, what do you mean? And they say, well, we're busy. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, oh, what is that? And, I, you know, and that kind of attitude, yes, I can pick it up. You all, customers, our customers pick it up. Mm -hmm. And we, we lose, or custom companies will lose customers because of an indifferent attitude. 90% of our customers will not complain to us. They'll go to Brand X. They will not venture out of their comfort zone and, and complain. I know you do uh, work, uh, this kind of work, around the country, and I'm wondering if there is a, perhaps a geographic difference in attitudes that you run across. Uh, here in Houston, where we've gone through some rough times in recent years, uh, versus, say, uh, other parts of the country? Well, my job does afford me to get to travel not only here in the United States, but in this past year I've been to uh, Germany, Spain, England, and France, and I picked up on the same thing, whether it be in New York or in Houston people's attitudes and we're in the service business one of my clients right now is losing some of their clients because they're able to send it over to Japan and get it back sooner than right here in Houston with that kind of competition we are really in the people business in the service industry we've got customers that we've got to figure out and we've got employees that we've got to figure out and so it's all this psychology stuff that really makes up as a matter of fact, the Mellon Foundation study said that 85% of our success is based on how well we communicate and only 15% on our particular product. Okay, well, I, let me follow up with that then. Um, okay, so you, you go in there and you say to a company, well, okay, I see these kind of problems with your employees and, and we're going to you know, make these kinds of changes. How do you measure that, how to, that kind of change or that performance? So they know that things are, are different. Well, we've got a profile test that helps take the guesswork out of it and the intuition. Uh, a lot of us can say, well, that person was rude, or that person doesn't communicate, that person needs time management skills. Well, we've got a method in which we can come in, and instead of it just being Jim Will's idea, we then can diagnose and do a scat scan of the company and find out the good, the bad, the ugly in a buffered manner where it doesn't offend people and it's not going to find out if the person is nuts or not. It's strictly <laughs> for productivity and then we can graph it and we can say, okay, your people are at this level and each person's at a different level. We're right here at this level. Where would you like to see them? They're selling this many units, this many widgets. How many widgets would you like to see them? Then we're able to track that success through a mathematical equation and also we've developed an incentive program in which we can tag on carrots onto those incremental changes and so we're combining the psychology along with the carrots but a lot of companies they say well we've tried incentive programs and they didn't work that's because the psychology part wasn't in there the attitude wasn't right come in and say okay we're going to have a trip to Cancun and who cares about that? It may not be what like motivates. Yeah. <laughs> it may not be what really motivates that particular person. So what we've done is we combine the psychology, understanding about the people, the attitudes, where they come from, how they can start to change, and then we start to plot it and diagram it and help them to see those incremental changes, and then we tag on those carrots along with it. Back to what I was asking just a moment ago, though, about geographic. Uh, influences. Would you say that in, in your travels you see more negative in, uh, influences here uh, added, or negative attitudes here than you do say, uh, I think you told me you were in New York recently. Right. We were just there last week and uh, yeah, what I've found, and we've got to be very careful, careful with generalizing, there are good and bad people everywhere. Uh, there are uh, the right attitudes in New York and there are the right attitudes in Houston. There are people that don't mind offending you and could care less if they had your business in both places. So uh, overall I think it's, it's an individual uh, situation in which companies, starting with top management and then their other management, the, the headline managers, are what's really going to help with that company's, that organization's attitude. It's going to filter down. 
And the low person on that totem pole is going to have a very, very similar close attitude as that top person. I guess what we're saying is people that, for example, would be in the real estate business in California, real estate's booming in California versus and, somebody in the real estate business here. And you better ask here, quick because we're almost out of time. Uh, uh, that there may be some difference there between their attitude, right? Yes. But here's what I like is instead of being the norm, let's be the exception. And that's where this can help us to be the exception. Okay, Jim. Well, thanks for joining us again. Oh, my pleasure. I enjoyed it. For more information on Dr. Jim Will's programs on a variety of topics, call 800-270-7583 or visit us on the web at www.jimwillphd.com. Copyright 2005.